let's talk about the uh, public health emergency that we've gone through, which, you know, we all, you know, started affecting us in February, especially really hitting us in March. Um, how have your practices uh, evolved and changed? Um, and how did your background and what you had laid the foundation led you to where you are right now, Dr. Gore? So we, uh, we instituted uh, a rapid escalation of our telemedicine program across the Department of Urology uh, in early March uh, of this year. Um, and so uh, around um, March 10th uh, to March 12th, um, there was a recognition that for the safety of our patients and for the safety of our healthcare team, we needed to, to address you know, our ability um, to care for patients, to have touch points with patients, uh, but to not actually see them in person. And so we went through our clinic schedules and we changed everyone we could change to either be rescheduled or to a telemedicine visit. Um, and we rapidly credentialed essentially the entire Department of Urology. Because we had had a grant to support our initial telemedicine program, we had actually pre-purchased a bunch of telemedicine equipment that we were able to pretty quickly deploy in our clinics. Um, and that allowed us to take some, you know, it's the University of Washington, we don't have very fancy computers. So we were able to upgrade those to have uh, nice video capabilities, nice microphone capabilities. Um, and with credentialing and some scheduling changes, uh, we were able to essentially turn over our entire clinic to telemedicine. There are still some patients that do need to come in, um, patients who need some surveillance visits, but for the most part, we have tried to convert almost 100% of our clinic into a telemedicine clinic. Dr. Spitz, how about you? How about your, how did your practice change? So our, our practice very much like Dr. Gore's changed rapidly uh, over the course of just a few days in early mid-March. Uh, the majority of the partners in my practice have adopted a policy of limiting patient visits to only those that are urgent, as well as procedures and surgeries. And the decision to limit surgeries is something that has been made at a higher order level amongst all the hospitals and surgery centers in our community. But nonetheless, we were all on board with that because we felt it was imperative to do our best to flatten the curve by minimizing the interactions of patients with each other and with our staff and with our staff with each other. Given that we're in a private practice, we can be rather nimble with the configuration of how we incorporate telemedicine. There is no particular credentialing that is required. And because of my previous experience with telemedicine and because we had a telemedical platform up and running in our practice, which anecdotally only I was ever using, even though it was available for the entire practice, that was ready to go on day one. Now, it is interesting with the increased surge of demand on the platform, it was rather glitchy for a few days, but fortunately, the platform was able to increase its infrastructure, and now it runs just fine. But we had it there to use. But even if we hadn't, the rapid changes in the requirements and regulations, including the HIPAA restriction being lifted, enabled any or all of us to use our cell phones or our laptops with platforms such as FaceTime or Skype. And so the rollout, as it were, was really not very hindered by hardware considerations. What was probably the most significant issue was just the novelty of it. And I was able to reassure my partners uh, how easy or straightforward it could be, and they could trust me in that reassurance because I had been doing it for many years. And I literally seen over 1,200 patients telemedically in our practice through the platform that we were uh, about to use. Um, I found that the engagement with telemedicine amongst my partners who were completely naive to using it, had never done a telemedical encounter, was remarkably fast. Uh, within a day or two, my partners were seeing up to 20 patients in a single day. Now, our practice is very busy, and those same partners might see 40 to 50 patients in person in a single day. But still, to engage at that level was um, remarkable. But then again, it wasn't, because I knew from my experience with telemedicine that it's a very straightforward process. And I think that that's what 
so many doctors, whether the urologists or other specialties are waking up to around the country that this is rather straightforward. And the patients themselves are also recognizing how straightforward and easy it is. And I remember there was a bias in telemedicine in general, and certainly I held this bias, that older patients in the Medicare population probably wouldn't be too happy with telemedicine, that this is really something for the younger generation who is tech savvy. And I'm finding nothing but delight amongst my Medicare age patients for whom I'm performing telemedicine encounters with. Dr. Ree, how about you? Changes uh, over so, the last uh, few months or so. Right, so, uh, you know, Dr. Spitz had mentioned about the regulatory hurdles and the reimbursement hurdles, as well as uh, licensing and medical legal aspects. These are things that were barriers to entry in regards to telemedicine. I, we were confident at KP where we already knew that the satisfaction was there, that the quality was sustained. The issue here is that COVID-19 brings with it the safety issues in regards to both providers and our patients, and as well, understanding how can we still complete create capacity uh, without just halting our practices. And so what's different for us is that the ecosystem is already embedded, obviously. And because of that, you know, our own local regulatory, our IT issues were already there. We've already, they were prepared for something like this. I think what it is now is it's a scalability. And I think that our job in our different practices is to convey what for, for me, it's actually the amount of work that we're doing on the telemedicine side, really to show government, regulatory, other regulatory agencies payers also as well, that this actually is a viable alternative, a, in, a, in a alternative healthcare model of delivery. It's extremely important to understand for the listeners that, you know, January 31 was when a public health emergency was declared. And in March was when really things really started getting get going. And really through two, two signatures by the swipe of a pen, the amazing major legislative and regulatory milestones have been, have been lifted, albeit maybe temporarily, but now the drivers for all of this work now is different, meaning that uh, the, the, the physicians are driving, the, pro the providers are driving this, the patients are driving this, and actually in the essence is uh, health plans and healthcare networks are driving this because of the backlog. So our, our move now, what we're doing is preparing for the future. What does the future look like, meaning that a recovery phase? How do we look at a telephone visit or a video visit, and how does that translate into future visits? And that's a really important aspect to this is to understand the pending suppressed demand. When I see suppressed demand is, I don't think that diagnostic imaging, uh, those things have been continuing on a regular basis. And so how many of these patients are sitting out there that really we need to move forward quickly on uh, because I believe that that's the next, if you want to call it the next surge, this is really the surge that I think our physicians who are on this call and this WebEx are really concerned about. 